Hello and welcome back to the Agassino Zynga show with me, your host, Agassino Zynga. And this is episode number 483. That's 483 of the Agassino Zynga show. How you doing? How you feeling? Great, amazing, good to know. If it's the first time checking the show via YouTube, you know what to do. Smash the like here, subscribe, leave me a comment down below. And if you're listening via the podcast app, a five star review and a share will help to show it, will help to get the show a long way. And of course, support via patrons is also more than welcome at patreon.com for Agostino. You can find more descriptions, you can find a link to that in the show the descriptions. Actually, just click it, and obviously, it'll send you there. It's only a dollar per month. You get to tour my bonus episodes and all that good stuff. So make sure you tune in there and get involved today. Do not delay. You get involved right now at patreon.com for just Agostino. Well, here we are back again. Hope you're well wherever this may find you on this nice, muggy, humid, um, stiflingly boring Wednesday. Um, it is making what was it? It's, it's pretty much okay for me on my end. Hope it's okay on your end. I'm just about finding the words to describe how uh, what you call it, uh, mediocre and just middle of the road. Everything seems to be at the moment, which you know makes a lot of sense considering the, the state of the world at the moment. We're in this kind of lull where we've kind of you know, by all accounts, especially in the UK, numbers seem to be going down in terms of cases and all that stuff. And deaths are at, at kind of you know okay amount. They're not an alarmingly bad amount of people are like thinking about it twenty four seven, but okay enough for people to ignore, which is effectively what we're trying to do, right? We get to a point where we want to not think about it, even though it's happening. <laughs> um, so that's obviously great, but there's still a bit of a lull because no one really wants to you know be shouting from the rooftops that it's over because it clearly isn't. And no one wants to pretend that it's like how it was, you know, a few months ago because it clearly isn't. So we're caught in this weird sort of like um, recovery perjury or something. I don't know what it is, but we, whatever it is, it's not fun. It's a bit boring. But, you know, I guess we just have to keep trucking on and hoping by, let's say, Christmas, hopefully, things will get a little bit more blissful, a little bit more brighter. And people, after, especially when once people are coming back from their vacations in the summer and whatnot, or even you know late winter celeb more late winter vacations people will be in far better spirits and collectively that will kind of improve everybody's moods you would hope so right that's be the hope but hey what can you do what can you do apart from that what else have i been up to um oh i've been smashing the new nas album that's been a pretty decent listen um obviously him and hit boy delivered once again on king's disease part two or king's disease two um solid from front to back obviously the standout track with um nas and uh uh, Lauren Hill on it is just you know phenomenal you hear Lauren Hill rapping um, which a lot of people have been missing a lot of people have been crying out for and she returned and kind of reminded everybody why she's so highly regarded and why people seem to have just as much time for her um, as some of the other elite rappers that we seem to have in a scene even though she only kind of has produced one critical body of work of course but still Miss Education is still an album that kind of doesn't it stands the test of time which is something i've really understood why people can kind of hold that as a slight against you just because you have one classic they say that you can't be in a conversation of the greatest ever because you've only got one it's like what's the problem of having one vis-a-vis putting out 10 shitty albums and only doing one classic between that i mean there's no it doesn't seem like there's any kind of um clear discerning criteria that would make that person who puts out 10 albums and then has one classic in the uh, on the 11th and a person that pushes puts out one magnus opus and then kind of dips i don't think that's a bad thing if i think it kind of speaks to her level of perfectionism that she didn't want to try and follow it up with a sequel or anything or anything or just try and build upon that just kind of left it for what it was and let the fans enjoy it which was quite good to see so that album was pretty strong listen to um it's just a joyous record, I think, if that makes any kind of sense. Maybe it's the fact that, you know, I, I'd imagine if you're a hit boy and you're working with somebody like a Nas, right? There's probably, how do you say this makes sense? It To me, it would assume, it seems like there's probably less, I would say, I would assume there's probably less kind of, oh yeah, it's on the screen here, yeah, but it's probably less, um, wow, it Pitchfork gave Kings of Z a 6.1. That's how you can't really give any sort of credence to review sites. I know a lot of people give a shit about what anti Fantana and all those people say, which I've never really understood. Maybe it's from a different era, but the last thing I want is to get, maybe it's one thing being recommended an album from somebody because they reviewed it, not because of what they say, just because they reviewed it. I might have not heard of a band or an artist. I'd be like, oh, who's that? And then I'll go check them out. But in terms of 
kind of you know um cultivating my entire musical library based upon what some people think is good or bad or what pitchfork seems to pick out as one of their picks it's like nah i'm not gonna do that and this is a clear example because i thought king's disease 2 was of course not as good as king's disease um the the original but still really up there in terms of one of the better Nas albums in recent years especially for people who have been saying oh he doesn't pick good beats oh um the production is usually crap oh you know he sounds dated this is a real refreshing sounding Nas without him doing that crony without him doing that corny thing that Nas what Usher was doing a few years ago where Usher whenever Usher was dropping I don't know why he seemed to be infatuated with trap sounding beats and he'd keep kind of doing these weird um these weird tunes where there'd be like a 60 second bridge which was amazing but the rest of it was just this trap sounding nonsense that he was trying to obviously cater to the younger generation but just wasn't working because just wasn't doing what he was great at doing which is creating great pop um r&b sort of records and he just wasn't willing to do that he wanted to kind of tap into what the kids were doing at that time it just sounded terrible at least with this nas record he just sounds grown but it also sounds you know modern yeah without sounding too cringe um it doesn't come across too boomery i don't know what it is just a perfect mix and again maybe it's the fact that if you're a hit boy and you're working with somebody so established as a nas even though there's a lot of pressure in terms of delivering and obviously meeting expectation and all that malarkey i'd imagine for the most part because he's so self-assured and he knows who he is as a person he's obviously extremely wealthy with all these investments that he's done i think he was one of the earlier investors in coinbase and whatnot it makes it puts less pressure on the album the album then becomes a little bit more of an experiment a little bit more of a creative sort of playground to just test out new ideas fool around with a couple of things and try and see what sticks to the wall and wow i think for me it kind of it really hit it off man it just sounds so lush so luxurious so refreshing so joyous layered um the range and the beats is just crazy i think you know similar to what we saw with london on the track and um and summer walker i think when two people are working in tandem like this from the front to the beginning they end up kind of bringing out of each other more than you would have ever expected so to hear hit boy be able to make some really classic hip-hop boom bappy type beats and also go into the kind of really atmospheric grandiose type of big room things that you'd imagine a rick ross could really slide all over and then go back to the kind of classic stuff again more r b time and stuff it's just amazing to see his range and for sure like as a hit producer i would assume hit boy his rates have probably gone up too off the back of this album but i really really enjoyed it i thought it was incredible like again there's something that i listened to in the background whilst i was in the gym and i found it very very enjoyable no skips for me for the most part i thought from the start to the finish even some of the skits that's what i mean if an album's good the skits don't annoy you sometimes when i remember tori is one of these albums that was terrible and um, especially when you consider his mixtapes but i think he learned his lesson and didn't do it again but he tried to do his whole skits thing and tell a story and it just you know threw off the album and made it a flipping chore to listen to but if the if the album's good you don't mind putting up with the skits and that's why i kind of saw with them now as king disease too so i definitely recommend check it out um definitely a standout album and again no no need to listen or read to what review sites say because pitchfork here i've got it this is the 6.1 I'm like huh 6.1 like I, I, and the thing that's 6.1 maybe I, I don't know how they score it are they scoring it based on what they think the album is or based on what other albums are because if we look at what album, other albums this year got a 6.1 I, I would it, you know I think Niles would probably be insulted if he saw his name kind of listed alongside this illustrious um you know um company but hey it is what it is you know everyone's got um the right point of view when it comes to music it's all kind of a matter of taste but again like i said if you're a fan of hip-hop and you love all that stuff i really recommend that you check it out man this is a banging 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 album um what else i've been doing oh yeah i've been listening no sorry i'm listening i've checked out and watched the interview with um Yo Yomi Park, the North Korea de facto that was on Joe Rogan recently. She's been doing the podcasting rounds as of what the last few months. She was on Jordan Peterson. She went on Lex Friedman. Um I'm not too sure the other one she went on something else, but she's been around, right? Which is kind of part part of you know, 
part of course i'd assume she's got a book coming out or something or just wants to increase her profile it's not really too big of a deal but the concept of what she said obviously on joe reagan was super harrowing especially when you put it into contrast with what people are arguing about on social media for the most part apart from covid when it comes to all the cultural war stuff that doesn't really matter um in the grand scheme of things <coughs> to get somebody speaking so honestly and upfront about the horrors of north korea however inflated or deflated you think her account is because now there's you know um articles coming out basically debunking some of the stuff that she says and picking out inconsistencies in her stories and we don't know this woman i don't know how old she is she might be late 30s or early 30s or maybe even in her 20s still she defected from north korea when she was 13 i would imagine a lot of her memories aren't necessarily pieced together all too well there's a language barrier loads of things going on i'm not going to hold her to account too much if she said oh i jumped um, my way over the border and then you found that the last interview said she walked Do you know what i mean i don't really give a shit really i still think the content of what she said is super interesting in terms of getting a peek um into a country that we have no idea what's going on do i believe it's a complete hellscape as some people do say it is probably not is it as great as some of the korean government um try to purport it to be when they invite flipping youtubers and influence and that's another one so i that they never understood no one really cancels or has a real is there a bit of i've never really seen people kick off and get outraged that youtubers and stuff who decide to go to north korea and go on those kind of package tours that they put people on and put them in those weird coaches and take them around a clearly set up area of their city in order to make it seem as if everything is nice and normal take them to a fairly affluent only well take them to a hotel that only the rich and famous types in north korea are able to go to in order to make it seem as if they have all the you know um trappings and luxuries of western life um of course not right but i it's interesting that no one really seems to kick a fuss about those influencers that do that really that's really bizarre but if you dare to say that you don't believe in vaccines or that you think covid is a joke people want you to essentially be hung from a bridge somewhere wild but regardless um i thought again the content of what she said was really interesting the stuff about catching cockroaches and you know whatever insects and eating rats and dead people being piled upon the street and whatnot is just insane and again just interesting to note that for all the world police stuff that america does they haven't tried to kind of poke the bear when it comes to north korea they haven't ever tried to kind of you know peek behind the iron curtain and try to relieve their citizens of the tyranny that they're living under and welcoming into the arms of democracy and capitalism hasn't necessarily happened they've just kind of left them alone and kind of turned a blind eye to all the people dying and soldiers running across the flipping what you call it border with flipping worms all over their bodies and shit they don't really seem to care too much about that which is another interesting part as well that where's that soldier he's not really talking too much in it but that might be a real good illustration of just how um similar you know, just how my universal the human experience is the world over right in north korea where you know people are living under this ty tyrannical rule a woman escapes and then she doesn't stop shutting up about her experience right in this yomi park and then that guy who is a soldier i think if i'm not mistaken when he ran across the border to south korea he got shot several times again like i said his body was full of ringworms and he was malnourished he was like on death's door and he managed to sprint you know the best part of 800 meters in order to kind of get to safety and he just about escaped and we haven't really heard a pip a peep from this guy maybe because he doesn't speak english but it's just interesting that you know there isn't much uh, difference in terms of how people um do things around the world especially mostly based on their gender the woman doesn't stop showing up and the guy is somewhere you know just minding his business uh you know doing what dudes do but yeah her accounts were super harrowing man what a what a way to kind of send to you and kind of get you back to normality and kind of make you you know think of all the things that you complain about not really mattering that much especially when you think about the other people around the world who are suffering through tyrannical governments you know think of people who are living in hungary um you think of all the flooding that's been happening in parts of europe and stuff it's just there's stuff that's been going on you know on a daily basis that we've probably been purposely and maybe for our mental health which is kind of advisable to do just been kind of put into the side and be like you know what i don't want to pay attention to it i don't want to think too much about it because if i do it's going to freak me out but it is interesting or it is good 
perspective wise to kind of be reminded that hey as much bad as it is over here there are people that are legitimately fighting for their lives every single day and the things that we take for granted you know for them is like a luxury so that was crazy to see and again even some of the skepticism i'm not too bad you know mad at i think that one article that um if i'm not mistaken the one article that tim dylan shared about it was pretty fair in some of his criticisms about Yomi Park in terms of her as a person and all this malarkey. I didn't necessarily think it was a bad thing personally. Let me see if I can get it up. Jim Dylan. There he goes on Twitter. Twitter. Let's see again. Boom, boom, boom. I did feel the criticism. Yeah, I did feel the criticism of her on that on that thing. The article was too shabby. If everything, it was probably just um healthy skepticism about some of the accounts that she put forward and some of the stories and the details in, involved in it but again the substance of it is still what it is isn't it like you're living in a country where you essentially aren't being fed you aren't being really looked after too well um your country you know there's no just sanctions against it you don't really get much foreign aid and you're all basically fending for yourself in a place where if you might listen to the wrong track you might get hung or executed in a flipping stadium in front of all your neighbors do you know what I mean like i wonder if that's even a concern the fact that you're going to get the fact that you're going to get assassinated sooner rather than later or the fact that you're gonna end up you know with your ass hanging out from your face in front of your neighbors in a massive stadium i wonder if people even care about that kind of thing maybe at that point you just kind of you know fed up but let me see if i can find it where is it he posted the article about uh there he is yeah this is the one it's from the diplomat it's a fairly lengthy article but i'll just read the first couple of bits that basically you know throw some cold water on some of the um you know pieces of information that yomi park retold this was in 2014 actually so there's people out there who have been skeptical about her account since then and again most of it might be again politically motivated in some respects because there is a weird I guess because she what she's kind of you know been doing her rounds in North America and for whatever reason has tended to be more welcomed within this kind of right leading side of media more so than the left side of media and then now people are using it as a thing I don't really know it's America it's fucking bizarre they always turn everything into like a Democrat Republican thing when she has nothing to do with them whatsoever but hey so this is the article here it's courtesy of Diplomat it says the strange tale of Yon Mi Park right if they pronounce it Yon Mi Park it says here one to 21 you're North Korean defector made her debut on the world stage in October this year. The harrowing tells of her life under the repressive North Korean regime and her perilous escape to freedom. She left audiences, human rights heavyweights, and journalists in tears, some literally sobbing. Wearing a pink traditional dress with a high waisted voluminous skirt, Park stood before the lecturer at one of the Young um, World Summit in Dublin and in two long pauses, weeping, wiping tears from her eyes and holding her hand to her mouth as she composed herself. She told of being brainwashed, of seeing executions of starvings or the sliver of light in her darkness and when she um she watched the hollywood blockbuster titanic and had her mind opened to the outside world was where love was possible <laughs> yeah this is a bit too much in it she said titanic is what opened her eyes to the western world like come on lady um why not die hard is it here and her mind opened to the western world where love was possible and of having to watch her mother being raped or burying her father the, her own on 14 threatening to kill herself after um, rather than allow mongolian soldiers to send her back to North Korea bloody hell she talked about following the stars of freedom and then ended her with a signature sign off when I was crossing the Gobi Desert and scared of dying I thought nobody cared but you have to listen to my story but you have listened to my story you have cared right and uh, you know she wore that traditional Korean outfit as well to the speech that she gave you know good, good way to kind of you know get the optics right in the branding and it continues to said you'd have you'd have to be inhuman not to be moved but for but you're going to hear a lot of buts. What's the story that what's the story that she told her life in North Korea accurate? The more speeches and interviews I read and watch and hear Park give, the more that I become aware of serious inconsistencies in her story. The, the, that suggests it wasn't. Huh? That suggests it wasn't, sorry. And whether <coughs> this matters is up to the reader to decide but my concern is if someone with such a high profile twists their story to fit a narrative we have come to expect from north korean defectors a perspective on the country could become dangerously skewed we need to have a full and truthful picture of life in north korea if we are a, if we are to help those living under the abysmal cruel regime and those who try to flee 
cool which is fair in it and i guess in the whole article she kind of picks apart some of the cases and inconsistencies that are there but then there is a pretty level-headed response here from yomi park at the end of the article which says here a response from yomi park and it says i want to thank mary ann jolly for caring so much about the terrible situation of korea that she would point out any inconsistencies in my quotes and how my story have been reported much of the time there was miscommunication because of the language barrier i've only learned english in the last year and i'm trying to find i'm trying to hard to improve every day to be a better advocate for my people i apologize for my misunderstanding for example i never said i saw executions in hishan in heisen sorry my friend's mother was executed in a small city in central north korea my mother still has relatives which is why i don't want to name it and there was mountains that you can see even on google earth maybe you can call them big hills in english outside of heisen that we cross and escape there are many more examples like this but one very important thing to correct i don't have any foundation the website was a dummy side by a friend da, da, da. i also apologize that there has been times when my childhood memories were not perfect like um, how long my father was sentenced to prison now i'm checking with my mom and other to correct everything i'm also writing a book about my life in north korea my escape through china and my work at to promote human rights it, it is where i will be at this is where i'll be to tell my story in the meantime i want to thank you all for your patience and kindness to me which is a pretty brilliant level-headed adult response because <clears throat> most of the time <clears throat> You feel like whenever people are being called out for their inconsistencies or their lack of information or lack of clarity or just question for their credibility, they tend to kind of go into their show and get a little bit aggravated and angry, which rightfully so. But I like the fact that she was mature enough to reply in that way. But that regard, that aside, I still recommend you check out the interview. It's on the JRE now at the moment. I think it might be one of the most recent interviews. The Spotify player is absolutely terrible. So you have to just bear with it and let it play out. I find that after about 30 minutes, 40 minutes, it tends to stop doing that whole pausing buffering thing it still does that annoying thing where even though you pay for premium you still get an ad or two that plays which is legitimately one of the most insane things i've ever seen especially when you consider you're paying for the premium service on spotify but you still get ads on the joe rogan experience podcast but again i love the guy so it's what it is but what, if you stick with it for the first 40 for the first 30 40 minutes it should stop buffering and it should be okay after that but yeah definitely a real sobering um interview to check out if you are complaining and kind of getting upset about stuff that doesn't really matter in the big grand world in it oh yeah yeah in the world at the moment i would say what else am i going to talk about <clears throat> let's move on yes yeah, move on so next on the list we have here a tweet courtesy of journalist laurie whitewell confirming some details regarding Rafael varan's transfer to united which by all extents and purposes, hasn't been completed yet, right? Um, we don't really have a jersey number for him yet. We haven't seen him in training. Medical supposedly has been done, as it's pointed out here. Rafa Rank completes his medical, buying a contract points to finalize. He hasn't even signed the contract, meaning announcement not expected today. Looking like a bench at most for the Leeds game, which is, I think, next week, right? Or maybe the week after, but it's fairly soon. And then the other update here is the announcement will be pushed back for tomorrow. He has completed his medical and imp posted photos. His number is believed to be previously unoccupied by a player. I think there was early suggestions that he was going to get number four, which was Phil Jones's number. And considering he hasn't played for us properly for like, what, four, three years, it made complete sense. But again, we can't seem to get rid of Phil Jones because he's on an inflated wage and he signed a new contract under, you know, Ole Gunnar Solskjaer's tenure, which is again, completely insane considering his injury record and the fact that when he does play he looks completely shit um especially not for the level that we need to be maybe it's not his fault maybe it is who cares but if we just move him on we can't move him on so then our key marquee signing we signed for Real Madrid we can't cash in on the branding with his number four thing we have to now give him a new number and he still hasn't been registered so it makes me think like is Man United the worst run top six football club in England and I think it is it clearly is there are so many weird things happening at the club that just don't make sense especially for like a top top club again the messy thing is a weird one but it's kind of an indication of where we're at like you know one of the best players in the world or the best player maybe some people would say in the history of the game is on the market and one of the most successful clubs who edward told us can do things that no other club could do wasn't in the running to try and sign him it just seemed bizarre again it might not have happened it probably wouldn't have happened considering messi's connections with psg with neymar and you know pochettino there being an argentinian legend blah 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 i know most likely it wouldn't have happened but just the 
the possibility, maybe the throwing out of a bid, the discussions of terms or whatever it may be, maybe him coming to the club and seeing the stadium, whatever. And then he decided to go for PSG, go for PSG. But the fact that we're not even in for him shows that we're probably not an elite club at the top, top level that we all probably think we are. And then this stuff with Rafa Varane, right? Like, you know, this deal gets announced or we get, we supposedly completed like a month ago, it feels like, and he still hasn't signed a contract. Um, he's only just arrived in the UK. Medical's only just been done and he's probably going to be on a bench for the game against Leeds. So no chance to do preseason. <coughs> <coughs> no chance to train with his new teammates. Nothing. Just starting off from where we were before. This is why I'm saying... I will be very wary if you're a United fan and you're really getting giddy about Sancho and Varane completely changing our fortunes because the glaring omission that we desperately needed to address from last season was our lack of defensive midfielder, which would change the entire way we play football. Having the ability to play one defensive-minded midfielder in that centre midfield and then having to free up the other positions for more attacking-based players who can do other things, who are probably not skilled or not have the tools to play that defensive role would make us a far more potent team, would make our attacks more cohesive, would actually allow us to have a style of play, quote-unquote. But when we have two defensive minded midfielders in there who both aren't that great at playing that role in McFred which is McTominay or Fred it just doesn't work and it ends up the, the ball ends up getting disintegrated because there's no one to kind of progress the ball through the through the phases and stages of the pitch which then makes us have to play someone like a Pogba there because he's one of the better players on the ball but then he doesn't necessarily thrive in that position because he's not very press resistant he just doesn't work well in from that deep especially without somebody mobile next to him it's just a complete shit show so you'd imagine a one place that would maybe be a great fix that wouldn't I would go as far as saying that we probably might not even needed to sign Reveran if we were to get like a really top class DM to play for us, right? We could probably got away with random DM and, you know, Sancho without the signing of Varane. We've still got a pretty stacked um, roster of centre-backs, even though they're probably all on the same level, apart from maybe Maguire, they're not, you know, world beaters, none of them. But we could have got away with that by just having a really classy, you know, defensive midfielder. And I think you see that with flipping Chelsea. You know? I mean, they've played most of the season with Christensen and with a combination of Christensen, Zuma and Thiago Silva. Do you know what I mean? And, you know, none of those guys you would say are kind of, you know, world-class centre-back, especially Thiago, right? He was at one point, but he's getting forward in age. He's been in a new league. We could have got away easily with playing Lindelof and Maguire still, but having a really competent um, DM playing in front of them. But again, that's not happening. That's been kind of put to one side. I think another press report came out recently saying United aren't going to sign a third player, which was not unexpected. I think most Man United fans with a head who are sensible would have known that we weren't going to ever sign a third player. I think if we ever were going to sign one, it was probably going to be a defender in terms of the right back. Was Those were the only real links and rumours you heard. But throughout the entire process of the transfer window, maybe apart from the odd Declan Rice rumour, I never really heard us being seriously linked to signing a defensive midfielder. Never, never once. Uh, not even like a uh, Declan Rice thing is a lot of really a good, you know, link to even ascribe to us because that's the easy option that everyone picks because he's the baitest name. But I didn't even hear like of a short list of like a option of, you know, this guy at that team who no one knows about, this guy that plays at Granada, this guy that plays at Rennes, this guy that plays at Lille. No, it was just Declan Rice. And that was it, and maybe a couple of times. But that led me to believe that more likely than not i think the fans want us to sign a dm more than the management does i think the management doesn't believe that mcfred is that bad of a partnership um if anything because i think you know he kept playing them all the time he didn't really change that system um he persisted with it regardless of the results regardless of the lack of quality of our football and the fact that we haven't been linked to one again shows that most likely you know the management or the coaching staff for whatever reason don't think a dm is important so that third signing was either going to be really lackluster and underwhelming in terms of a right back like a kieran trippier who in my opinion is okay but is he going to move the needle at man united probably not is he any better than what dallo can do on a good day probably not maybe comparable because he's got experience but again tools wise if you give Dallow a full season to really cement his place and be able to compete fairly with a Wan bissaka then fair enough um i don't know and is there even any kind of 
is there a real shot of Trippier being able to display someone like a wan The fact that he, you know, most, plays most games, hardly gets injured. Yes, he's not that great on the ball, but I don't know. It would have been a really underwhelming sign regardless. So I'm happy that we've kind of closed the book because I'd much rather us not buy anybody than just sign play for the sake, for the sake of it. They already annoy me by giving everybody that's got like a year left on their contract an extension. The last thing I want just us to be signing players for the sake of it. So, hey, it's concerning, it's upsetting, but it is what it is. I still think people are going to be in for a shock when it comes to our quality of play, our style of play, and the lack of change in the way we play. I think the Varane and Sancho signings are going to paper over the cracks, um, but I'm hoping they're going to be proven wrong. I'm hoping that we start off really quick out of the blocks and we come out and just win our first five matches, you know, boom, 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 boom. But I doubt that's going to happen. So, yeah, that's the case over there. Then we have some really decent pictures of um, Jaden Sancho finally arriving at United Training, posing here with Ole Gunnar Solskjaer, of course, the United manager, which looked pretty cool. Solskjaer is clearly happy to finally have his man. Um, I don't think any um, any critics of you no know, any critics of people who are fans of Ole can say that he hasn't been backed because he clearly has. He's gotten two record transfers already, right? record yeah it was two high profile signings in terms of english talent in harry Maguire and Jaden sancho right two players that were north of 50 million and um he's been given all the backing necessary in order to be a success so now the pressure's really really on and this is how i would have it i don't want to have it any other way i don't think it's fair for Oli to just be able to skate through without any real criticism that's the thing that really i understand some of the Oli inners i get it right it is annoying to keep hearing people constantly talking about how crappy of a manager he is and he's a PE coach when he keeps when you know being above all these other coaches that everyone seems to kind of wank over I get it right and this obsession with style of play can get be a bit nauseating all this malarkey fine 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 but the fact of the matter remains if you're the manager of Manchester United you're expected to finish in the top four that shouldn't be an achievement but then you are required to win trophies. That's just one of the things. You're required to compete for the league. It's just in, it's just part of the parcel of the history of the club. And if he, he doesn't want that kind of pressure, he can go manage Arsenal. We've already seen what go on over there. But I don't think it's a bad thing for him to have the pressure. I don't think it's a bad thing for him to be put under the spotlight, to be people to think, okay, because you've got the signings, you've got the backing. If you don't deliver, then you have to, you know, your job will have to be put into question. And I think that's perfectly fine. And if anything... For somebody as an elite performer as he is, somebody who clearly is a United legend on the playing side, he should be able to perform and really be able to bring about his best. Because the one thing that you have to give him credit for last season even, every time his back was against the wall and it felt like he was about to get sacked, he'd always kind of string together a, a, a run of good results. Always seemed to be able to pull it out of the bag. And that way it was because the players love him and they went to keep him in a job or because he was able to just figure it out by himself and his coaching staff and work out a plan that would get us back to be successful. Regardless of whatever the situation, he'd always figure out a way to get us back to winning ways. And I'd hope because of the pressure he's under because of the scrutiny because of the light that's been shone on him especially with all these signings that now will finally be the time where he finally decides okay cool let's make the necessary changes and let's go for it because if we do i still don't think we're we're anywhere i don't think we should be in a position where we expect to win the league but we should be challenging we should be in a position where we finish the season within a few points of the title we might not win it in the end because of the competitions that we're in and because you know usually it seems like when the pressure's really on our coaching staff and our team seem to crack and crumble and don't really rise to the occasion Villarreal final in Europa League a good example if that's the case cool but at least let us have the possibility of dreaming that it could be possible you know maybe winning a domestic cup an FA Cup we haven't won in flipping ages maybe being able to do that maybe even a league cup but I'm still a believer I've said it before I think Oli needs a trophy more than the club actually needs a trophy if all things being equal because I think regardless if you know if Oli leaves this club will still be successful I think I think there's too many good players there for it not to be successful um you only need a bit of tinkering to figure it out and if Louis van Gaal and Mourinho and all these other great managers were able to win trophies with a fairly you know mismanaged squad a far more mismanaged squad than this especially in terms of unbalanced then I'm sure the next manager coming along especially if they know what they're doing will be able to win a trophy fairly easily 
mentally. So that's not really a big, big, big concern. I still think the most pressing thing is for Oli to win a trophy so that he can start to have a bit of belief in himself and the players can have a bit of belief more in the system or in this direction that we're doing this whole cultural reset bullshit. Because <laughs> it's all well and good throwing around those jargons, but unless you're winning stuff and you're actually showing proof of the concept is a proof you know proof that that kind of approach is working by silverware then no one's really going to believe what you're going to say so fingers crossed that happens but again it's good to see Jaden sancho finally donning united um training kit it's been a while we've all kind of waited especially united fans and holding our breath in terms of um finally getting a moment where we see him in the united training kit which looks really nice by the way um they do they do good in terms of making fans want to buy this stuff especially in the midst of all this glades are out protesting but the, the training kit looks flipping sick on him so yeah let's hope um we can hit the ground running in the next season and be able to string a couple of early wins and then hopefully hopefully get a first trophy in the locker cabin in the you know in a in a cabinet in a trophy cabinet and if it doesn't happen and again like i said then some changes will need to be made you know need to look at who we hire next and kind of go from there but so far so good so far so good what else is next okay yeah next here we've got a story courtesy of mix mag it says oxy garden in berlin has been closed due to noise complaints which is really upsetting because i was actually planning to go and check this place out um i think i kind of it came to my attention i'm gonna say during the beginning of COVID, because i think i might have been when it actually opened and it was one of the only what well, and it, obviously that was um a time when it came about because that was when berlin were experimenting with kind of open air parties and stuff and allowing people to gather outdoors this was kind of during the first peak first second peak whatever it may be and obviously a lot of outdoor spaces kind of places were popping up all over the place um there's another one called prince Lauerberg bar something there's a few that popped up out of the, out of the blue kind of overnight and they seem to be doing fairly well people seem to be enjoying them they were obviously kind of built with the idea of being open air so they kind of really kind of you know worked really well in the current predicament that we're in and were just a cool um way to you know rave if you couldn't be raving indoors and of course in a place like berlin it made complete sense so i was really looking forward to going myself and the programming was really good fairly extensive um a good range of people playing long short sets whatever it may be i think it ended at a fairly normal time not super you know late after 12 so it felt like a fairly cool place to go but it looks like in a really weird twist of events because it feels like there hasn't been a big maybe i'm misspeaking it but if i'm not mistaken it doesn't feel like there's been a big sweeping amount of kind of club closures recently in berlin for the most part most of them have kind of survived or well, maybe through grants and support from the community but uh, it feels like within the last few months or weeks there's been two or three places that have closed back to back to back to back to mostly due to neighbor noise complaints and i wonder if that's a consequence of just people again having the break because this has been probably the longest time that berlin for especially as a city has had any kind of prolonged period where clubs have been closed outside of wartime right or whatever it may be so with that neighbors have maybe gotten used to and enjoyed the idea of going out in their local neighborhoods especially if they live around clubs and not having you know condoms on the floor and drug paraphernalia and just people screaming and shit and noise you know what i mean they've gotten used to the luxury of that and now that they've been reopened they've suddenly become annoyed at things that they weren't annoyed at prior i, I wouldn't surprise me but then usually it feels like the berlin laws have or regulations or whatever it may be they usually have a law in place where they permit places to stay which you know i think it's less there's probably still gentrification over there i would assume so but it's probably not as bad as it is in london because in london it feels like if there's a cool happening place wherever it is in london that all the you know cool interesting people go to um they obviously make it hot they build their own places they build their own clubs and centers and studios and whatnot and then suddenly all this foreign money investment comes in and they build blocks of flats in there to obviously capitalize on the coolness of that postcode and then suddenly um the same people that made it cool get kicked out with no option of kind of living um you know um living in there with these new occupants um even though they made the area cool but it feels like in berlin they have these laws in place that kind of make sure that people who have been there prior have more say so and all this malarkey and there's constant dialogues going on between venues and local neighborhood groups and stuff so usually <coughs> they seem to have some sort of weird agreement <coughs> because if you've been there you'd know that most of the clubs aren't like in 
derelict nowhere places right they're usually within the main city centers city center limits sometimes around you know residential areas so the fact that they're able to go on for loads for you know early hours of the day without people complaining or you sometimes you've been to after parties where people are playing loud music and no one really knocks on doors and shit it just seems to be like there's an understanding this is what people do but i don't know maybe again it's a covid thing people have kind of just had enough of it and be like you know what i kind of enjoy this peace and quiet i have in my neighborhood and i don't want to have these places back at the level that they were prior i don't know but let's continue the article says oxy garden building closed due to noise complaints it says oxy garden has announced it was closed until further notice the open air victoria starts is it starter venue confirmed on instagram they'll not be able to open this weekend due to local police confiscating a license so let's go to the actual post on instagram it says here the fairly it's a pretty good um post as well the graphic design is really cool that they use or the artwork art direction whatever they use for oxy garden is brilliant but again you know it's a sad state of affairs to have to give them compliment off the back of this news but hey announcement our venue will stay closed until further notice we hope to see you again soon says the post and the caption says regretfully the um latter has forced us to close our venue for august until further notice absolutely brutal in it so there's a l big amounts of programming ahead i'm sure there's a bank holiday coming up am i sure am i not sure i'm pretty sure i'm sure but regardless there's a full programming ahead so that's a lot of people that they're having to disappoint in terms of bookings and all that and obviously the ability to earn money on their side of things just oh that must be gutting so it's here suddenly we have been dealing with so it continues said sadly we've been dealing with repetitive noise complaints from a small but vocal minority of neighbors despite taking out six figure loans and grants only for noise cancellation and technical reports certifying our compliance with the law and despite always communicating with them in advance and lowering our noise even below the legal limit each event took place in the approval and official permission of the council so far however the increasing complaints led to police entering our venue and confiscating our per per uh, permits under false pretense oh no we're currently fighting back but need to prioritize the safety of our staff and guests until we have rock solid legal solution otherwise bureaucrats in the lichtenberg and the police will continue to aid and abet these neighbors by finding new pretext to harass us authorities who have lauded um, themselves as the saviors of club culture have not helped us in any way and only paid lip service this is threatening everything that our team has worked for and achieved the blood sweat and tears duh, duh, duh. at this point the heartbreak and we are the situation we appreciate your support and hope to see you again soon so again like it it must be super disappointing because i've done with the exception of a few places it does feel like most of these clubs that pop up don't just pop up out of the blue they usually come through loads of communication and dialogue with local neighborhood groups they don't just you know pop up in a legal spot as they were prior in yesteryears because it's just not worth it to invest in the equipment the programming the production the staff and the security just for you to do a, an illegal event only for it to be locked down because the neighbors don't like it it's not worth it if you're going to do a proper place you're going to do it properly so to suddenly have this you know small but vocal minority of neighbors suddenly kick up a fuss about it it must be a bit of a kick in the balls but again um on the neighborhood side of things it just must be one of those weird things where unfortunately covid's given you this weird like relaxation period where you've been able to enjoy your neighborhood relative peace without the clubs and now that they've reopened some people just not having it even though they agreed prior they just changed their mind now which again it sucks if you're a fan of clubs but i can totally understand it on both sides i really can and i'm and i think this is where authorities and governments and stuff should come in and decide and just be able to call it and say hey you can't complain anymore we're not going to respond to your flipping cries and noise complaints these guys are doing what they need to be done in order to make sure they abide by all the you know limits and all that malarkey um let's just agree to disagree you don't like the noise they don't like that you keep complaining and let's just work out a plan that suits both parties and go from there but this whole like holding of people's heads and calling people on the forays and stuff must be really frustrating and debilitating and i'd imagine too having people police arriving at your venue all the time to search it and to make sure you're complying with the ordinance can put people off as well so for club owners it's probably annoying to have that constant you know horde of you know official police polizai uniform people storming your club it's not the best thing for patrons it might put them off from coming again there's loads of things that go into it but you know again um r.a.p to oxy garden for now um temporarily hopefully they reopen soon because again i want to check it out selfishly myself um but hey this is kind of the nature of the beast and it? it feels like with these clubs you've got to just enjoy them whilst they're there you can't really think too far ahead which is why i don't believe in the idea of buying tickets too far ahead i think you should kind of live your clubbing lifestyle day by day and just take every day as it comes and enjoy the moment live for the moment don't just think too far ahead because 
because really unfortunately for the most part in most governments most countries it feels like there is a concerted effort to take away any kind of enjoyment recreational that in youth people or you know people in general seem to have and want to unwind it just always been bizarre to me but hey what can you do what can you do next we've got this really interesting weird post courtesy of Gegen Berlin which if I'm not mistaken is a collective um, based in Berlin obviously um, they do queer kind of BDSM parties I'm assuming if I'm not mistaken I read an article that they did one in Kit Kat um, Club and a few other places so they're fairly well known again in that kind of circuit and they put out this interesting strange little caption here on Instagram which I thought maybe piqued my interest because I saw that obviously the video of Chet Hanks you know essentially going on a massive anti-vax anti-vax sorry ra um volley volley rally volley diatribe whatever it may be called whatever that thing is and it made me think of this when i saw this i was like oh my god this is so similar in it but it also made me lol because this is a further illustration of the same kind of you know problems i had with some of the business techno discourse and the playgrave discourse and all this malarkey was that for the most part most of these people djs included and collectives whoever they are you really shouldn't be listening to anything they have to say, right? These people are put together pretty decent events. They program pretty good lineups. <coughs> they maybe put together some cool, you know, artwork for the flyer that they're going to promote on Instagram. And that's about it. You attend their parties, you do your kit and you keep it moving. But the idea that you would take any kind of, you know, social responsibility, um, COVID talk, um, mobilization rhetoric, rah, rah from these people and use it as a manifesto for you to guide your life or to inform the decisions that you make is just, in my opinion, absolutely insane. The fact that you would listen to anybody outside of a club who wears stuff like, because again, it, this is my, myself included, right? If I walk up to a nightclub in techno, a techno nightclub, you know, the worst thing possible is for you to be a caught in the toilet somewhere um wearing this kind of garb with people you know sniffing whatever up your nostrils um taking whatever in your mouth and then suddenly getting into some deep philosophical conversation about the terrors of flipping you know i don't know about critical race theory right um about universal basic income regardless of what it is there's nothing more cringe nothing more embarrassing than that and you know groups of you know affluent or you know socially mobile young people you know thinking they can fix the world's problems in the toilet somewhere listening to techno it's just horrendous so the fact that these posts even exist makes me always laugh and again i think it's just a consequence of covid because most of these people haven't had the opportunity to do what they actually do best what they're actually put on this planet for which is to put on raves and allow people to bum each other in dark rooms which is fine but the idea that these manifestos have anything to do with the real world and people really listen to it and or you have strong reactions to it either or just makes me laugh and this is the post itself it says here gag in the air right which i'm guessing is one of their event series that they have coming up or uh a, a seminar or a way of thinking who knows it's just nonsense gagan air wants to question the concrete need for breath the lack of air the fear of it the pandemic has forced us to hold that breath the supremacy has prevented us from breathing what's the supremacy why supremacy created covid didn't it come from china like i don't know the authorities disperse um, us by filling the air with tear gas how much more do we need to struggle in order to breathe what air is being breathed today this sounds like somebody is kind of you know one of those like shitty um you know performance art pieces that you would see in an art gallery somewhere in some hipster area right someone kind of reading from their little phone you know you know again phone apple or this malarkey whatever reading some poignant you know poem performance piece uh beat whatever thing about this you know environment or whatnot it's just like oh yeah yeah and everyone you know clicking their fingers it continues evolution teaches us that life can also exist in an in an anaerobic conditions that some organisms proliferate in the absence of oxygen all these big words for nothing the mechanisms of power can take over and take advantage of toxic and polluted environments climate crisis capitalism white supremacy there we go again with that word patriarchy what does patriarchy have to do with covid all of these things are legitimately some of the things that want me to you know you just want to just jump off a cliff somewhere it's like these people are legitimately some of the most brain-deaded 
people you've ever seen in your life but it makes sense again and you know doing tons of gsb and care and coke and molly and stuff in techno places doesn't necessarily lend to you know nuanced ways of thinking and articulation and whatnot it just doesn't lend to it. it is what it is it fries your brain trust me i've been there um toxic and polluted environments climate crisis capitalism white supremacy patriarchy and other forms of oppression forcing us to live and continue adapt to the external surroundings just as happens in a suffocating relationship so now what am i blaming my dad am i blaming my girlfriend am i blaming the patriarchy am i blaming apple like what's going on who's the boogeyman here it continues um gagan air wants us to make its way through its environments and bring you an aesthetic um asphyxiation by using air properties to transmit the vibrations of sound waves so basically they're throwing a party without a mask it feels like and they're trying to make it into some sort of weird rallying call for people to go out there and breathe it's like oh fuck off the scent of the sweaty bodies and dancing um ecstatically to repetitive and obsessive musical rhythms the sense of freedom the lightness and mindfulness the freshness of being surrounded by urban greenery the oxygen that we all need in order to breathe we invite you to be free like molecules in the air expand yourselves and your horizons like vapor and clouds and be the proliferant sorry and be the was that was that good the profilant the profilant i don't know what that word. how do you say that word the profilant the profilant of your own well-being the profilant of your own well-being be air be geigen air take a link in bio drag queen hashtag drag queen hashtag lgbtq oh my god and obviously everyone in the comments clapping clapping liking liking it's just like i don't even know what that means i don't even know why that matters it just sounds like absolute gobbledygook to me and another clear indication that techno people dance music people djs collectives whatever should just focus on what they do best programming putting on sick events um allowing a whole generation of youth to feel like they're comfortable in their own skin and they don't have to hide who they are providing a platform where people from all different walks of life can dance and celebrate and you know ingest opious amounts of drugs um free from any kind of the social constraints that they live day to day and that's it all this other rara talk is just so much horseshit it's like i don't know you couldn't i, I don't know I, I want back my five minutes because i, I don't know what that was gagging there eh? like if you just want if you want people to go to your party and not wear a mask just say isn't it we've got a, we've got a party on we reserve the right to run it however you want to run it take a test before you come but we're not going to be requiring people to wear a mask when you come to our event <coughs> cool do that <coughs> no need to wrap it in all this pseudoscience all this pseudo uh, pseudo um philosophical shit you know i mean this is just like this is just i don't know i really don't know just imagine someone reading this wearing that and then you have sitting there and taking it seriously like huh like if you're wearing that i want to hear recommendations on tunes i want to hear recommendations on places to go and eat maybe places to go on holiday funny clubbing stories you know whatever in it in things in situ i don't want to hear you talk to me about the day the dangers of flipping bolsonaro the, bolsonaro's presidency in brazil you know what i mean like you're not there right now we're not there right now we have no idea what's going on there day by day nothing we say is going to change everything it's just a waste of time but hey maybe i'm in the minority here so big up gegen air i guess gegen berlin berlin the place to be sounds like an absolute nightmare with some of those folks but hey maybe i'm wrong maybe i'm wrong <coughs> god got a finger right in my throat frog or rat whatever it was anyway this is um let's continue here We've got news courtesy of Sky is News. It says, fit and healthy man, 42, killed by coronavirus, regretted refusing vaccine, a sister issues misinformation warning. I've seen these, a lot of these articles pop up all over the place, right? And I'm starting to think they're a little bit psyopy. Like, you know, the powers that be are purposely placing these stories out there in order to what? Scare people into getting a vaccine. And I feel like at this point, if you haven't got it, you've obviously not got it because of some reason, right? It's not because you haven't been encouraged to get it. It's not because you don't have access. It's not because you're not educated on it. You just choose not to get it. And I think for whatever reason, the government doesn't seem to accept the fact that they're never going to get, in my opinion, over 60% of people, the population, maybe even over 70, let's say, there's over 70% of the population to get a vaccine. It's just never going to happen. Um, it just is what it is. I don't know. Especially as time goes on and there's more, you know, um, cases and stories of people getting a vaccine and still getting the virus, like all these conflicting bits of information and it's been politicized and weaponized and all this nonsense it's just difficult at the moment to get a 
want to agree and fundamentally it feels like western society just doesn't necessarily lend itself to people maybe thinking of the greater good it feels like when it comes to the greater good arguments which kind of the vaccine is basically being should be pushed as because you know there is no real there is no real cohesion cohesive argument or no there is no convincing argument really to somebody who says oh if I, I don't need to get one if you get one right but the whole premise around it is that we should all strive to get it so we can all kind of look out for each other but you're just not going to do that in the western society because we're a very individualistic society right we're not really much we, you know every, the, the individual is more important the whole than the sum of the people so you're not going to ever get the individual to think about everybody else because they're never going to care about where everyone else is thinking they're going to only think for themselves and this is what's obviously happening with the discourse around covid and not getting an anti-vaccine anti whatever it may be and again i just think these stories are just not helpful in the slightest i don't know what they're meant to do i don't know how to do they're meant to convince but from what i've seen the people who are pro vaccines are never gonna be not convinced that they are a one stop shop um in order to make sure that you'd never die from covid again and the people that are anti are never gonna convince that you know cell phone towers and you know whatever and you know tracking systems are being you know placed inside of the virus they're never not going to be convinced that it's true it just is where they sit you know feel ideologically wherever it may be and that is just the nature of the beast and maybe let's just improve other things around it you know maybe more information maybe more process maybe more education maybe more research goes into where it came from i don't know whatever but it feels like spending time putting out these stories that does nothing for the discourse if anything it just drives people to be more separated and to be more divisive and to be more in evil or camp or whatnot it's just i don't know i don't even know how this got politicized personally it always boggles my mind because if you would have told me anybody but, you know i think most people would have thought a global pandemic would have made everybody a little bit more kind of um you know maybe a little bit more nicer to each other would have made people kind of want to work together to figure out this issue that's affecting everybody around the globe it would have made people realize how inter interdependent we are to maybe put aside our differences in order f you know to again for the greater good but if anything it's just exasperated some of the splits it's exasperated some of the camps it's made things even worse than what they were prior um and it's just never gonna go back it feels like we're just living a divided society maybe social media i don't know what it is but i just feel like these stories like this fit and healthy man 42 killed um regretted refusing his vaccine his sister look she's now in front of the press it's just like what does this do to everybody what does this do to his family you know it's dragging his name in the mud the sister gets a little five minutes of shine but then like, next week no one will remember what your name is you know he dies in what in complete shame and embarrassment because you know you're a fit and healthy dude and imagine getting wiped out by a virus that you could avoid dying from if you got the virus. it's just i don't know and who knows why he didn't get it he might have had a reason for we don't know we'll go, we don't know what the situation is but regardless it just feels like these stories are psyop up in order to just drive more division in terms and instead of actually bringing people together and allowing people to maybe understand and accept everyone's differences and everyone's point of views isn't it? i don't know it just feels a little bit pointless in my opinion maybe i'm wrong let me know in the comments down below what you think next on the list what else do we have here oh we, this is hilarious we have future calling his baby mother a hoe via a text to his kid which is weird but i guess you know if you're future and you're a global superstar and you're flying around the world maybe this is how you communicate to your children and of course the mom's got access to the phone and then you got a screenshot here of the screen that says tell your mom tell your mom mom what um to buy you some clothes dad it says your mom is a hoe right here the last text at the end <laughs> and i'm sure the kid probably went to the mom and asked her what does that actually mean and then she had to describe or explain what that word means or he him as a kid probably didn't really believe what her mum's his mum's explanation was and probably ended up googling it himself and when he got to school or when he aimed, ended up getting hold of his friend's phone that he used the internet with but it's just hilarious isn't it that this is how some people communicate to their significant other especially when you have a kid you just imagine some people would be a little bit more grown up but and i again maybe it's just me and uh you know my uh kind of laden misogynist nate yeah my late my laden toxic masculinity or whatever it may be but this is kind of partly the reason why i kind of love this man because he's so unapologetically like him right especially when it comes to his dealings with the females the female side of things he tends to do, he tends to do and say stuff that most people wouldn't want to be 
um, seen doing in public. He doesn't necessarily seem to care. And, if, you know, unfortunately, it's obviously negatively affecting his kids and, you know, his family. And, you know, of course, the, the, the mother, the, the woman that he ends up having the kids with ends up getting embarrassed in public. But I just don't know, man. So sometimes I think that these people are incapable yeah sometimes i think these people are incapable of being embarrassed in public because part of me also thinks as bad as this is i wouldn't want to take a picture of it and upload it on some social media i wouldn't want anyone to know that my baby father who happens to be one of the biggest rap stars in the world is calling me a hoe and texting my son and letting him know that his mum is a hoe i mean i wouldn't want it to be done because i don't want anyone to look at me and think less of me do you know what i mean i'll just deal with that stuff in private i'd beat him up i'd whatever fleece him for more money i don't care but i wouldn't want to let the world know do you know what i mean i wouldn't want to let the world see me down but these people online as well man it's just a different breed of people that brain is a bit rotted in it where you kind of want to upload the picture and show people see he's a bad guy it's like yeah we knew he's a bad guy like everyone did like you know i think most of his baby mothers knew he's a bad guy but they still you know shacked up with the guy for whatever reason no one's judging you on that but this isn't a surprise it just is what it is but again it's just a unfortunate circumstances because again you know there's a family there's a kid involved and all that stuff but i just don't know there's a part of me the real scumbag you know wanting to you know push an old lady out of the queue side of me that just can't help but kind of you know punch the air when i see this sort of toxic masculinity out there this gaslighting of females especially there's another post where he's i think she posts some other you know text threads and messages and statements that she made about how crappy of a guy future is in terms of looking after the kid and whatnot and then, then he tweets just one line pray for her do you know what i mean like he's a king of gaslighting i think someone said in the comments the absolute king of gaslighting is future that he would just say pray for her as, and in response to you know he's been one of his baby moms essentially tearing him a new one and saying how many bad things he does day to day and he just responds pray for us it's like god almighty this you just can't help but respect that i don't know what it is it's really bad it's really sad again kids involved bloody blah 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 but part of me just thinks god man and then also part of me wonders when will we ever get to a point especially now with future approaching what is it 10 8 i don't know baby mothers he's got however many kids when will it ever get to a point because it feels like we're still not there yet it still feels like whenever future gets into a spat with one of these baby mothers in public there's always more love for the woman in, in the argument than there is for him but when will we get to a point in society do you think where people will start to maybe hold the women accountable that decide to lay down with this dude shack up with him you know fuck him about a condom and have his kid because quite clearly it doesn't seem you know some guys you know when they have kids they change and they become more mature and decide to settle down and i don't know just move a bit different he's just not doing that he's just never going to be that guy if he's not doing it now approaching 40 he's not going to suddenly do it now he's not suddenly going to do it in five years i would imagine it just doesn't it seem it just doesn't seem likely but when we ever get to a point where we hold the women accountable and be like, hey, maybe don't hook up with him, right? Even though he's, you know, a very high profile star and I'm sure behind the scenes is a extremely charismatic, funny dude because when he does the interviews, doesn't do them anymore. He is incredibly engaging and, you know, interesting to listen to. But maybe don't shack up with him and think he's going to be an actual hubby hubby. You know what I mean, or a stay at home dad or a dad in any way, shape or form, especially in the traditional sense. Because from the time he's texted one of his kids to tell his mum that she's a hoe, you'd know it's mad. But maybe again, we're reading too much into it. Maybe because this phone is a phone that he's contacted the woman, the mum on it before. I don't know. It's just just hilarious man it's just it legitimately is one of the most hilarious text threads you've ever seen in my life and don't be surprised if you see him use that in a line he use that in the lyric for an up-and-coming tune or something soon if there's one thing he does really well is kind of embrace the meme i think i saw a show recently where he's performing and on the screen they had loads of memes of him from twitter where people put together you know like him obviously using the phone him holding all the um, basketball champion rings like loads of really funny sort of things that kind of poke fun at the legend that he sort of created over the years so for sure he's kind of clued in to how people view him in society but you know he doesn't seem to really care <clears throat> then we have this pretty interesting weird news that's been on the timeline for a bit which is again pretty much you know an irrelevant story but you just might as well talk about it because people are talking about it on the timeline it says courtesy of the new york post it says why are and why are anti-showering stars trying to make us stink 
And it says there's been a big stink over celebrity shower habits, but experts say that there might be more to this soap opera than meets the eye. You get it? Jake Gyllenhaal recently became the latest in a smelly string of A-listers from OG and T, um, deodorant duo Matthew McConaughey and Cameron Diaz to modern weight to you see dirt proponents Aston Kutcher and Myla Kulis, who are freaking out fans by admitting they embrace the funk, right? For some reason, don't I don't know why, I'd assume it was a very cleverly, well put together, coordinated press attack by all these publicists that work with these celebrities in order to make sure that they keep their names out there because if there's one thing that a-list celebrities want is people to be talking about them because that, that would help them negotiate a higher fee for the movies that they're in and to make, make people watch the movies that they're in blah 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 <coughs> so for sure <clears throat> I don't think this is by chance. I think this is for sure some sort of coordinated attack. And now we've all been inundated, us being the, you know, um, regular average average everyday people we've been inundated with information we clearly didn't ask for and we clearly don't want and now we're questioning our own washing habits vis-a-vis -vis these rich and successful people who for whatever reason think that not showering for a couple of days is okay because you don't look or seem smelly it's just like i don't know um maybe it's a white thing i don't know but we continue it's a quote here it says more and more i find bathing to be less necessary said jake gyllenhaal 40 when he told vanity fair last week his aromatic admission came virtually unprompted which is again more sense that there was a coordinated attack as the outlet had asked about his experience in nyc as a water town all tied to gyllenhaal's appearances and prada's ad for the luna rosa ocean fragrance so imagine the juxtaposition and the insanity of a, a, an a-list movie star deciding to announce in an interview that ties in with him being the face of a fragrance for one of the most storied fashion houses in the entirety of fashion in prada and then let it be known that he thinks bathing is not necessary like what i really can't. I, I don't know i just don't know um it continues says so what emboldened celebrities to share the advice on bathing rituals or like they're for um the annals of digital media point to monday um sorry may 9th 2019 when a viral origin tweet by aussie culture critic sophie wiener who doesn't think it's gross to skip soap on most body parts i don't know how what people do then um wiener proclamation proved to be contentious with more than 10,500 retweets perhaps not coincidentally taylor swift 31 revealed on ellen just a week later that she doesn't wash her legs in the shower imagine being a as tall as Taylor Swift is, who allegedly is anywhere between 5'10 and 6'2, being a woman who's about town and usually wears a lot of long, short dresses and shit, right, to show off the legs. You know, you're about in heels and whatnot, and just walking about and doing whatever you're doing and not washing your legs. Wouldn't you think that the one of the longest surface areas of your body would gather up some levels of dirt over the period of a day or even a week? Like, I don't know, some of these people are legitimately insane. And again, it's not saying, you know, I understand some white people get a bit weirded out when you go to like a black person's house and they've got a, a washcloth or they've got a loofah because, you know, it's just a different thing that people tend to use when they're bathing. But I understand not everyone wants to maybe scrub their skin with something so coarse and maybe there's some fillers, there's some kind of scientific thing behind it that's not necessarily necessary. I get that argument. But the idea that you wouldn't want to just put a bit of shower gel or a bit of soap in your hand and just cover your body is just wild because for whatever reason, it's okay to put soap on your hands when you're washing it. But then it's, if some people think it's weird not to put it on your body. It's like, why wouldn't you want to have some level of soap that can take away some dirt? or whatever or just even for it's just for your mind i don't know i don't get it um it continues says one day uh one day after swift confession professional yeah we don't care about what that yashi ali guy said he's a knob however the dirt the dirty or, or not debate riddled Try to dribbled out until Twitter user da, 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 launched a now viral confession on March two, 23rd when she said I only started washing my legs after the white people don't wash their legs discourse. The Twitter admission guarded more than 44,000 likes and 15,600 15, retweets. Since then, stars like Jin Hall, Kirsten Bell and Dax Shepard have proudly come forward to unshower praise of status. Um, pioneered by baby wipes legend Brett Pitt. Jesus Christ, anyway, let's not go there. The movement has become so strong, in fact, that some stars have been forced to come forward with their defense, um, saying, I'm not standing, I'm not starting trends, I shower, trust me, said Jason Momoa, a micro man. And then, um, obviously, The Rock had to stay as well, says he washes because he works out a lot. But the one I think was the most concerning was probably the Mila Kulis one, because everybody else, you know, they're just nasty 
adult whites you know it is what it is but if you've got kids and you're doing stuff like this like you might deserve a bit of a knock on your door from the child protection services mate it says here Mala Kuna saying National Kutcher right it says on the Dak Shepherd podcast I'm your expert with co-host Monica Padman that Mala Kuna's 37 came clean about how she wasn't that parent that bathed in my newborns considering kids shit and vomit all over each other i think there's a viral video that's going around Twitter at the moment of this girl talking about her nie her niece right i think her niece is a girl little girl and it's a toddler basically and basically you know speaking sar sar sarcastically about um the kid shitting and pissing all over the place and as she's speaking about it in a kind of jokey manner the kid starts vomiting profusely out of its nostrils and mouth right and that's just a standard thing that kids do, right? They piss and shit and vomit everywhere. It's just, I guess it is what it is you do when you're a newborn. So to have a newborn baby and it's a piss and shit and vomit all over itself and for you not to bathe them just seems insane. What are you doing? You're just wiping away the vomit and hoping for the best and what? Washing its face? I don't know, man. These people are nasty. It continues. Um, uh, da, 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 da. She wasn't a fan of washing newborns of children, Wyatt Isabel and Dimitri Podwood. Portwood what kind of names are these man for two kids from the same family why are Isabel and Dimitri Portwood you'd think they were adopted didn't it? it's like wow anyway husband Ashton Kutcher 43 then elaborated if you can see the dirt on them clean them otherwise there's no point and this makes me so frustrated because I remember when I was in that's probably one of the best things about growing up in the hood and going to like a normal shitty school in the ends is that you quickly get to realize if you're a smelly kid or not people tell you it doesn't matter you know if you got money or what and i was a smelly kid so i think this is why it's so kind of triggering to me and i was told under no circumstances i shouldn't wear certain shirts and i didn't put the you know people let me know when i stunk so i think when i got into the point when i was able to look after myself and i was interested in girls and i wanted to impress and whatnot i took it really seriously my that's the one thing that i knew i could control i didn't have much money i couldn't buy the best clothes i couldn't take them out to amazing dates and shit right but the one thing i could was be able to present myself in the best way possible whether it was getting a shape ups and making sure my two tracksuits i had were always washed or the couple of t-shirts that i like to wear i never wore them during the week right i did whatever i could to make sure whatever i had was of quality or I would present itself in the best way possible and i couldn't imagine ever especially at that time as well imagine when you're younger most of the time i'm always right you're always running i don't know why when you're a kid you're always running you're always sprinting for buses sprinting for to, to find your friends you just i don't know you're always running so imagine at that age telling yourself that you're only gonna wash when you see dirt on you how about if you don't fall down and you just keep sweating is that does that mean you don't you don't wash yourself like i don't know man it's just an insane place to be but then it also makes sense because who's ever gonna tell ashton kutcher or my lacuna so they stink Who's ever going to say that in their life? No one. Do you know what I mean? They're legitimately paying for people's mortgages and putting people through school based on their talent of acting and being able to be an entertainer. No one's ever going to tell them that they smell. They're going to put up with whatever woo-woo shit that they do and just keep it moving. But it's just sad that the kids have to suffer off the back of this and they think it's normal for their kids. They think it's, they're going to think it's normal growing up that it's okay to just wash when you see dirt. It's just like, oh. Their meme worthy comments spawned several viral responses when Kutcher and Millie Kulis walk into class. Oh, kids walk into class. Yeah, that's funny. Yeah. But Jesus Christ, grime is sure sign of. But yeah, I don't know. I don't really get it. Um, you know, white celebrities are just doing what white celebrities do. Um, what they say here, this is white people again. This is Kirsten Bell and Dax Shepard. They said, I'm a big fan of waiting for the stink submitted kirsten bell 41 imagine these are grown people with kids i'm a big fan of waiting to hear what that's why sometimes you i don't know i don't know man I, I, imagine looking as good as these people look right as in aesthetically and not going to step above and just looking after yourself and having a bath and using better fragrances and showering yourself every day why wouldn't you do that if you've already got such a good base like why it's just such a waste of um good genes it's just like i don't know man these people are insane but again maybe it's a white thing i don't really know maybe i'm mistaken let me know in the comments down below let's move on there my nose is leaking like a dog <coughs> and then we got here this news courtesy of hype piece about the off-white dunk nike lows the 50s which obviously have you know for the most part i think today and yesterday or a couple of days ago people who've been lucky enough to be selected <laughs> to have a chance to enter the raffle to buy a pair I should have been notified already the distribution of these has been hilarious to see 
it's all this it, the the conversation around these shoes when they drop always especially when it comes to virgin and off-white stuff is always hilarious because for the most part most people always start off saying the design is shit right that was what the first thing came out when the original images leaked or the original color codes leaks and people were putting together the um, mock-ups of what the shoes might look like and then virgil had that post where he was like oh i could never design something so shitty i'm best designer in the world and everyone's like okay cool and you know that discourse and people got angry at him and then he kind of had to set the record straight put out the material and then people tried to convince us that they didn't like them <clears throat> and then the release information comes out and they let you know here that you will see random distribution here courtesy of Hypebeast in terms of getting your pair <clears throat> god almighty my god frog in my throat so obviously if you're not familiar if you're not aware it's obviously um nike dunk lows there's a collection of 50 very different colorways you know different color bases there's a whole educated nuanced um researched way of kind of looking at the shoes and how they got to this you know conclusion it doesn't matter right now if you want more information about that go on virgil's profile i'm sure you put up some you know supporting information regarding it but the release information is the most interesting part of it, it says here um the release information was released in a sneakers live episode hosted by lucian dixon and it said the following the collection is made up of 50 renditions following a similar sale gray colorways with a variety of colors used in the overlay laces last lot in particular will take on an all black colorway with the white laces each pair is looped with a signature off-white tag and contains a badge and a midsole um pertaining to the number of the shoe out of 50 cool all well and good according to the episode all colorways will see a random distribution on sneakers exclusive access wherein users will be able to snag a pair but won't be able to choose which pair they're getting right so number one you have to get exclusive access to sneakers which is not permitted to everybody right only some accounts have it maybe it's you know some people would argue it's how much you buy on there which is all gobbledygook because they, they do the same thing with like the overshoot market and like um what is it what site is it and some of those sites and they were still oh, it's how much you buy from the store it's, it's bullshit it's random who knows what it really is we don't have any idea because these people won't tell us because you know that's where their main ip and kind of you know um hold over the scene kind of hangs completely understand that but you have to first get the exclusive access and then once you get the exclusive access you can't even choose which pair you want you have to you just get given them randomly now don't get me wrong it's that not shouldn't be that much of a episode or that much of an issue because the likelihood of you getting the all white pair that everybody wants or the all black pair is unlikely anyway and the rest of the colorways are much of a muchness they've mostly got the same base with only the real difference being the insoles the tongue and the kind of overlay lacing system thing on the top and obviously the number blah 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 but you know it's most of it is cosmetic don't get me wrong i understand cosmetics is important in sneakers but it's not like a you know if you if you get this and that there's no big big difference but the fact that you can't choose is one of the most insane things that i've ever seen in my life and at the end here lucky winners are only allowed to select their size right so they're preventing you from choosing your own colorway but then they're only letting you buy it if it's your size legitimately one of the most insane things i've ever seen and it continues said so dixon stated that hardcore fans of off-white and sneakers will have a higher chance of being selected rather than just merely watching the sneakers live episodes what does that even mean what does that mean so if you're a hardcore fan of off-white and sneakers what does that mean because he's only what how many shoes has he put out via nike right um all of them were limited all of them were put through some raffle system so i'd imagine there's not a lot of people that are able to get a lot of the pairs of shoes if you got one does that mean you're a hardcore fan or not so you had to watch this live sneakers episodes what does that do does that put you in the in the running to get in a pair like the games and the fugazi nonsense that they pedal like i think i was talking about it today early on twitter it's like these brands nike especially right they have such a it feels like disdain for people who they clearly market these shoes to they make it as hard as possible for you to buy them they don't really respect the consumers it feels like for the most part they take the piss out of them they spend the best part of what a year maybe less sending shoes to influencers and letting them wear them first and making you get excited and giddy over the shoes which is great marketing it works you see young lord wearing them you see asap nas wearing a shoe that you like and you think oh i want that shoe and then when it comes to having opportunity to buy them it's limited because there's not a lot of retailers out there because of the nature of retail cool it is what it is and the ones that are available <coughs> they want you to like a post they want you to leave a comment they want you to share something tag a friend all this nonsense to have the chance to enter a raffle in order for you to win the possibility of buying a pair with your own money 
they've even over this entire process especially in the sneaker world they've somehow been able to change the meaning of what a raffle means back in the day when i was growing up a raffle meant you would buy a ticket for like a nominal fee a dollar a pound and that ticket would permit you the possibility of winning a prize that far exceeded the ticket that you bought so maybe you could win you know a washing machine um a car or whatever that's what usually entering a raffle was about but now they've made raffle to mean the opportunity to buy a shoe that you obviously want to have the money to pay for and then to make it even difficult they don't really explain the process of you being selected there is no rhyme and reason how you get selected it's just completely random i will say before like i'd really like there to be somebody to make an experiment where they'd spent the entire year um calendar year january to december trying to enter as many sneaker releases especially some of the high profile releases throughout the year and try and see how many shoes they were legitimately able to get and i think it'll be frightening the amount of shoes that you're actually able to get in a year it's not that much especially the stuff that you actually want not the shitty things that they try and pedal on sneakers because they're very clever that way nike they'll throw in some stuff that you clearly don't want on the app just so you can notify yourself and reserve and in case you don't get a pair you want you're still going to end up double dipping or you're still going to end up trying to buy a backup pair in order to kind of save the day quote unquote and it's just funny to me to see sneakerheads on social media complain and cry over these things because it doesn't change because no one cares because it feels like sneakerheads love the punishment they love to get pissed on by these brands they love to get taken the piss out of because it kind of makes them feel like they're part of something it kind of makes you feel alive but i'm at this point where i don't count myself as a sneakerhead i think those labels are flipping corny and lame as fuck and i'm a grown adult and i have disposable income and if i'm able and willing to buy something i should have the pop the op the opportunity or the possibility of doing so i don't expect to be able to buy an off-white shoe in fucking jd sports don't get me wrong but i'm not going to do a cartwheel to try and buy a shoe i'm not going to write an essay i'm not going to take a picture of my foot in my bed do you know i'm not going to do nothing stupid i just want the easy possible chance to get it which is why still to this day there doesn't seem to be a better option than just having the ability to buy the shoe at the store and queue but again queuing you know that whole system can get a little bit fugazi but they haven't been able to create a system uh you know after all these years after all the billion and you know it feels like billions that have been spent in the sneaker industry you know around the world they still haven't figured out a way to clearly and adequately supply shoes to sneakers i want to buy them and i just don't buy this idea but limited edition all this stuff now go go jump off a cliff sneaker industry now is a billion dollar industry everybody and their mom is a sneakerhead you just have to make more it just is what it is you can't keep purporting to make these shoes limited but then they flood the market no one can get a pair but then everyone can get a pair and then you limit where you're going to sell them like you can't have two you can't have both things at once i don't think so both things at the same time you can't just keep pushing everything as limited and then keep making thousand like for this this is 50 pairs of shoes uh, what's the overall quantity of them do you think overall in collection hundred thousand maybe less than that more than that it's a lot of trainers right it's a lot of flipping material it's a lot of um junk it's you know it doesn't really ascribe to the whole sustainability thing that everyone seems to be on at the moment and it just seems to be so perplexing how you just can't give people the opportunity to buy them because it still feels like to me the sneakerhead scene is still relatively small when it comes to and in comparison to the overall general consumer that buys shoes right i'd assume the there is still a great number of average joes who just go and buy you know classic new balances classic air forces a classic pair of reboxes year in year out who don't care about sneakerhead stuff right so if that's the case and they're still serving a niche scene of people who are clearly still passionate about it why not just give them the shoes so they can buy them i don't understand all this song and dance all these histrionics and all this flipping games and theater it's just nonsense and again it's just sad to see the sneakerheads crying about the same thing because nothing seems to change like you know you've got this page here la free life um posting a screenshot of you know them be unsuccessful to get you know the chance to buy the pair this is i hate sneakers that more every day single day but again they come back every year and more people here in the comments posting screenshots so they're like what what is this we've, we've if we've seen one screenshot do we need to see three we know what a l screenshot looks like but they'll come back again every single year every single day every single week they'll come back to get their face pissed on by these brands because i think they enjoy the punishment i think these guys legitimately enjoy the thrill of catching an l the thrill of will i won't i be able to win a chance to buy a shoe with my hard-earned money it brings them life it gives them joy 
and these sneaker brands have, are not being held to account. No one's really calling them out for, again, these flipping, you know, artificial or, yeah, you no, know, these kind of uh, um, artificial scarcity things that they do with these quote unquote limited edition shoes. It's just a nonsense. It really, really is a nonsense. But that release. Again, I like the shoes. I was one of the only people that actually said when they first dropped. I think I make a couple of clips on my channel about the shoes in general. I quite like the dunks. I think they look fairly good, especially the black and silver pair. But I think most of the colorways in the entire 50 collections are pretty decent um, as dunks go. Again, dunks are my favorite model in the world. But the cheek of these people is saying to you that you can't even, you know, first of all, you need exclusive access to get a pair to actually have a chance to choose and then you can't even choose a pair they have to be given to you and you can only buy them in your size it's just like oh, the goal the goal on these people man which is why i'm which is why it makes me laugh when all these sneakerheads have also get on their high horse about people that buy reps and, and fakes and stuff it's like what do you think what to do not everybody is, is willing and happy to put themselves under some level of embarrassment and kind of shame in order to go through this nonsense of asking friends to bring you in and get you a pair. Not, one, not everybody's okay with that. Some people just want to buy shoes and keep it moving. They don't want to communicate with stores and send emails and fill in Google Forms. They're just not for it. So if some people are willing to just do the floss thing and go and buy a pair from a Shenzhen factory somewhere, let them be, isn't it? Of course, they know deep down it's not the real thing. It is what it is. But it's just funny that you see these sneakerheads kind of policing shoes for the brands when the brands themselves aren't doing anything to help these guys get the shoes. You know what I mean? They're fighting for them and they're not fighting for you. It's just like, it's a nonsense. It's absolute nonsense. So you did you know kind of indirectly these brands doing all this fugazi stuff they've indirectly kind of you know built and kind of spurned this whole replica fake scene which is indirectly sponsoring flipping you know terrorism attacks around the world and then they've got these guys on the other side you know with their limited edition sweat factory shoes they're not giving everyone a chance to buy it's just like I don't know. I absolutely don't know about this stuff. It just is legitimately insane. And this is this is coming from somebody that's worked on the inside. My time working at Nike has all showed me that it's not even better on the inside. It's just it's e equally harder to get them when you're working for them. It's not even a guarantee that you can get a pair. You still have to beg and ox people for favors and suck a dick and you know check up on people and say, "Hey man, hope you're well, man. Just checking in to see if you got like you have to do all that cringy stuff to get shoes. It's not even easy. You can't even just fill in the form at your desk and have someone bring you a shoe. You have to kind of you know suck someone off uh, on your lunch break or whatnot it's just all a nonsense it's all a nonsense i hate it all i hate it all which is why i'm just you know buying the stuff that i buy the old stuff the whatever trying to rebuild my collection with the stuff they actually like but when it comes to trying all this stuff if i can't just fill in a form that just like my size and enter and see what happens cool but i'm not going to like and subscribe i'm not going to retweet i'm not going to tag a friend in the thing i'm not going to send you like i remember those skate shops asking you to send them stories about your first dunk like go and fuck off like jump off a cliff honestly do a run honestly run into a wall run into traffic if you think i'm going to tell you a story about the first time i saw someone do a kickflip like are you insane insane like oh yeah yeah these people are absolutely sick in the head i guarantee you they're sick in the head but anyway let's continue let's continue let's continue let's continue um what's it got here yeah okay so we, it's courtesy of mcdonald's we have here it's the sweetie meal which dropped over the weekend which i don't get um i think obviously in branding terms it's good because hmm yeah i don't get this but what it does show i think for most people i guess for any up-and-coming artist this should be the reminder or the realization that you need that it's probably more important for you to get your branding right than it is for you to <coughs> ensure that you have a signature sound or that you have a hit record or whatnot just concentrate on your branding of who you are as an artist because in my opinion, considering the lineup of previous people that got these McDonald's meals, right? BTS, J Balvin, who else was it? Uh, Travis Scott. I don't see why Sweetie ever got a McDonald's meal deal, a collaboration deal thing. Like, it doesn't make any sense, right? She's got, what, one good track that people might have known, maybe two. They all kind of sound alike. She's 
pretty much a mediocre rapper for all intents and purposes hence why she did the whole boot camp thing as an artist to try and get her bars up she's obviously an extremely attractive girl but in terms of an artist she's doo-doo i think yeah you know especially when you think of the landscape of female artists out there like there's far more people out there that you would imagine would be more lending to this than a sweetie but again it's the branding in it because you know she's known for eating really crazy combinations of things cheetos and dips and things and ketchup and sauce you know that crazy american instagram way of eating where cheese is always dripping and stuff is always flowing and there's always color all over your stuff whatever you know just kind of horrible stuff that makes you want to gag in your mouth and that's the reason why she got this deal but it doesn't really make any sense again with the previous people that they kind of had on the lineup but you know the branding of it is really cool i guess you've got this um sweet and sour sauce which is a a good um play on her name of course and it says here yeah, just drop the sweet email is an iciest summer collab of the year we've got a big mac a four-piece chicken nugget me medium fries and a medium sprite with sweetie sour sauce and the interesting part about this things is usually it's a meal right that they do the collaboration with the artist and it's like they just pick their favorite go-to meals that they eat at mcdonald's and then usually you just go and buy the same thing in your own place but sometimes it's not branded i think the travis scott stuff wasn't branded but then he had merch tied in with it some of this stuff looks like it's branded but it doesn't seem like they go out of their way to create a specific burger or anything it's just what your order is at mcdonald's so it's, just, it's what they always do in stores and they just you want you to copy your favorite artist and what they do which is a little bit dumb but hey it's what it is um remix like sweetie fries and your big mac or chicken nuggets is like what this is like um uh inspiration to eat stuff i, I just don't know I, <laughs> there must be a something a little bit unbecoming of a young lady to eat like this right to have like what nuggets on top of chips like this with a sauce on the top to have your big mac top taken off and have fries on top of it with a sweet and sour sauce to cover the big mac bun with sweet and sour sauce to put on top of the nuggets in between the bun like <coughs> if ever there was a way to illustrate the differences between how people in north america and europe eat this would be it like what is this this is complete garbage this is like this is like what someone would eat if they've this is like evidence of somebody's being left at home alone a lot right you're in a single parent household or you're both your parents just work all the time and like a latchkey kid you have to fend for yourself and this is kind of what you kind of make up in terms of keeping yourself fed but this just looks disgusting personally i love the branding of it of course she looks great in the pictures itself but like this just looks nasty like who's doing this who's eating like this it's just and the interesting part about it as well it's like this is all cute but imagine the outrage if we swapped sweetie with lizzo who again i'm not really the biggest fan of when it comes to her antics online but that's why sometimes i kind of understand her pain because it's okay to be like gluttonous and horrendous with your eating um ways and whatnot when you're a attractive fairly slim young lady but when you're a bit on the heavier side people then look at you like you're a disgusting pig but people don't look at her the same way in it it's just all optics it really is but this just looks like bath worthy stuff I, I just don't understand any of it i really don't and they had her kind of serving people in the mcdonald's they had security there for some reason obviously here's her looking again the press shots are really good she looks so great in everything i've seen so far the pressure is a super tacky over the top um extra you know what i mean they really kind of lent into her name and the diamantes and the flashiness of it all but i just i just don't understand i just don't get it this little advert as well let's play this i'm sweetie and this is my mcdonald's order i get a big mac chicken mcnuggets fries and a sprite with sweet and sour and barbecue sauce but i like to mix it all up so i'm gonna put some fries on my big mac or top my fries with chicken mcnuggets what? or make a totally new sandwich like this as long as you're doing you you're doing the sweetie man but for mcdonald's is such a clever way in it to kind of get brand exposure tie celebrities to your brand and obviously get a bit of marketing out there in it because you're not changing anything about what they actually do it's just people just them getting celebrities and telling people it's just getting them celebrities on board and then letting them know what they order when they go there and then you know the remixing stuff is like remix is like that's a bit cringe because you know playing into the whole hip-hop thing but hey we let those guys do what they need to do but i don't know man i just don't understand for all the people out there that could be having a mcdonald's deal this seems like one of the most bizarre ones but again another indication that if you're able to market yourself and brand yourself it's probably a far better place to 
concentrate your efforts as opposed to the quality of what you make um i think you even see that with some of the stuff that virgil's done really and the branding and the idea you know he's a hard worker he did hundred projects a day loads of collaborations that probably gets you further in your career than the actual quality of what you do and then the hope is the more you do that over time the you're learning in real time and obviously then the quality of your work would then hopefully catch up with your level of marketing and branding expertise and that's what he's been able to do so i think that's where you that's why a lot of artists if it's like musicians why it's kind of fall short they basically just lean into the branding and the shock jock marketing approaches more and just hope that that kind of can continue on forever it's interesting to see people on social pointing out that this orange jumpsuit she's wearing is fairly similar to like a very popular um well-known legendary scene from the adult entertainment world <laughs> but yeah man i don't know i don't know the, the mill looks disgusting the remixes look like you know something that you'd see on some instagram food page i don't get it but i guess you know for people that want to be part of celebrities worlds this probably makes sense if you want to you know eat like a queen um but i don't know i don't know it's, it's icy see remixes things not for me not for me and then what else have we got here i think we should maybe end it with this stuff right let's end it with this here so it appears as if <coughs> sorry there it appears as if new york governor andrew como has resigned over sexual harassment claims he says the best way i can help now is to step aside i for one am shocked um of course the claims against him are pretty bleak to be honest it's just hilarious to hear him say you know not verbatim it was obviously kind of alluded to the idea that he said i'm not a pervert i'm just italian that's part of my culture i get handsy or whatnot especially when you read through the actual accounts of the women but it felt like when these first accounts kind of surfaced he was kind of being very bombastic and driven and basically saying hey i'm not going to resign this is obviously a political attack this there's no credence to these allegations blah 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 and it felt like you know with everything going on in the world maybe the best thing was to do was to just carry on and just kind of put your head down and just do your job in order to make sure you know your state was okay and to ensure the economy was bouncing back bloody blah, blah 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 but obviously as things have gotten back to some semblance of normality it did seem like if you were somebody that was trying to get Cuomo out the best way to do it would be to ramp up these allegations again get some other women on board on record to kind of run through their stories or share their experiences and then you'd hope in this kind of i want to say low period but when people are back outside and living their everyday lives and their kind of eyes are kind of gone off from the covid thing that suddenly these accusations would hold a lot more weight and they'd kind of get back into a new cycle again and that would put more pressure on him and he eventually would have to resign and i for one fall because he's such an arrogant pompous kind of you know blowhard that clearly thinks he was going to be the next president which is hilarious and a lot of the media obviously thought he was going to be the next president too he he clearly thought he was going to be able to weather the storm and he was w well liked enough in order to kind of get the benefit of doubt but again the press in america the media is just terrible because you think to yourself if this was a republican that did this a republican governor if this was ron DeSantis that was involved in something like it's just imagine what the coverage would have been like just imagine the cause for him to resign how loud they would have been it would have been wall-to-wall -wall coverage of everything that he did every kind of communication he had with a female would be dissected do you know what i mean so the fact that he was kind of given the first benefit of the doubt is something that wouldn't have been extended to anybody he survived that he wasn't able to obviously survive the second and now he's out and um just in terms of that as well it's just the lack of shame too that just operates in the world it's just something that's always boggled my mind you know regular people in everyday life are having to battle with having episodes of shame shameful moments things that you wish you never did never said blah 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 but it feels like whenever you reach a certain level in life socioeconomic level you can just do away with shame shame doesn't exist you can kind of just bluster your way through it no one really holds you to any kind of standard especially if you've got a job like the one that you know andrew Cuomo had new york governor right you'd imagine you'd have to kind of carry yourself in a certain way maybe not do some of the things that he's being alleged of doing and you know it, I would be horrified if anybody said this about me right just now as a person imagine having the job that he has and he didn't even feel the need to like no let me just bow out and let you guys concentrate on what needs to be concentrated on and i can go and fix my life and create the things that need to be corrected it's like nah i'm gonna stay in this job this job is mine i'm not going anywhere it's like god almighty the hubris on these people man it's just horrendous 
So it's a courtesy of CBS News. It says the following. New York Governor Andrew Cuomo announced his resignation, resignation sorry, on Tuesday after more than a decade in the office as a state legislator pursued, uh, pursued sorry, an impeachment inquiry and missed sexual harassment allegations. Cuomo, who gained national prominence during the COVID-19 pandemic, had been accused in a report by the state attorney general of sexually harassing 11 women. 11 um, including staffers as well as people who did not work at his administration. When I first heard it, I thought, well, you know what, it's probably over the top, they're going a bit extra. But when you actually go through the accounts, which I'm going to specify in a moment, I don't know how he just didn't walk the first time. It's just perplexing. But hey, it says here, I think given the circumstances, the best way I can help now is to step aside and let the government get back to governing. Why didn't you do that in the first time, you absolute wally? It says here, the reservation <coughs> is effective in 14 days, sorry. Lieutenant Governor Kathy Hochel, is it Hochel? Hochel will take over. Cuomo's announcement came one week after the state attorney, um, Letitia James, announced that the findings of the investigation to claim sexual harassment and a toxic work environment against him. Cuomo's top advisor, Melissa DeRosa, who was mentioned more than 108 times in the report, resigned on Sunday night. It's always funny as well when these things happen. Well, not always funny, but it's always interesting. Whenever these high profile sexual harassment cases happen, there's always a very prominent high profile woman also that's kind of maybe aiding and abetting this person's behavior. And they always seem to get thrown under the bus as well, which I don't really understand because part of the reason why someone like him can assault people to that level um, for such a prolonged period of time is because he has the power and the influence to kind of get away with it and everyone's scared to report him. So why don't people extend that grace that they extend to victims of people that worked alongside him? Do you know what I mean? That woman, I don't think, you know, was um, coordinating meetings to put people in positions where they were getting assaulted. She was just trying to make sure she had a job. Do you know what I mean? Everyone's working. Everyone's scared of getting fired. They want to stand next to somebody whose star is obviously, obviously so bright and who had aspirations of going to the White House. It makes complete sense why they'd kind of turn a blind eye. But we should just focus on a monster, not on the... You know, do you know what I mean? The people next to them that were quote unquote complicit to what they did. Obviously, their time will come, but I think the main focus should be on what he did. So there's a lot of discourse I saw online, especially on social, with people being like, oh, what he did wasn't too bad, and it's just a cultural thing, and these girls are being snowflakes and stuff. And then you go through the extra accounts of what happened, and they're all listed on his Wikipedia, right? No one wants this, right? No one wants to be. Imagine having a Wikipedia page that looks like this. Andrew Cuomo sucks your harassment allegations. Like, this is every man's nightmare. So there's a whole list of allegations, right, of, of women and detailing what they basically said, what he did to them. Let's read the first one. Lead, uh, Lindsay Boylan said the following. In December 2020, Lindsay Boylan, a former aide of New York Governor Andrew Cuomo and then candidate for Manhattan Borough President, accused him in a series of tweets of sexual harassment and creating a toxic environment. The New York Times published a link to Boylan's lengthy essay, Medium, wherein she accused Cuomo of sexual harassment and described several years of uncomfortable interactions. She said she resigned in 2018 after he forcibly kissed her during a meeting. So imagine doing that to one of your staff members, right? As a as a boss, as somebody working in politics, knowing the power and the influence that you have and the uncompromised positions that you can put some of your employees in because they have aspirations of working for your administration, whatever it may be, and you do that and you don't even walk off the back of that. Imagine not having the embarrassment or the shame just to be like, you know what, I'm going to hand in my card now and keep it moving. He continues, she also alleged that he had compared her to a former girlfriend and asked her to play strip poker. What a sick individual. <coughs> it continues here. Let's do another one. Um, Charlotte Bennett said in late February 2020, Charlotte Bennett, an executive assistant and health policy advisor to Cuomo, accused him of sexual harassment, which included questions about her sex life. In March, five videos of CBS Evening News, um, anchor Nora O'Donnell, um, no, sorry, Bennett, the woman said that during a one-on-one -on -one meeting with the governor in his office on June the 5th, 2020, Cuomo implied that I was old enough for him and she, he was lonely. Bennett went on to claim that Cuomo's office director took the state's mandatory sexual harassment training for him. I was there. I heard the director say, I can't believe I'm doing this for you and making a joke about the fact that he was completing the training for him. And then I heard her ask, end him to ask, then I heard her at the end, ask him to sign a certificate. Oh my God. So yeah, clearly a bit of a piece of shit. And then of course, this is one of the most, you know, horrendous ones. Brittany um, Comioso, Brittany Comiso, 
you know, commissary yet, commiso, on March 9th, 2021. It says here, the Times Union of Albany reported an anonymous um, member of the government, the governor's executive branch staff had accused Como of inappropriate touching. On March 11th, the same newspaper reported, she said Como called her to his mansion, reached under her blouse and fondled her. Como denied the allegation. Jesus Christ. On st uh, April 7th, 2021, an unnamed executive assistant took over and that she had been summoned to the governor's office in November 2020 to help Como. The problem with his phone. After um, reaching him, Como allegedly rose from his desk and began groping her. After the aide told him his behavior would get him in trouble, Como then shut the door and said, I don't care. He returned and groped her one of her breasts under her bra by reaching under her blouse. She then left following the groping. A month later, she claimed Como told her to cover up and that would uh, cover up what occurred her identity was revealed on june on august 8th 2021 and imagine this guy's with daughters too i think he used a daughter's excuse later on in his press conference but i don't know man the the shame of this is most likely he's probably gonna you know sliver back into politics again he's probably going to go on some sort of redemption tour he's probably going to do some you know therapy thing and there'll be pictures of him arriving at some center of sexual addiction i don't know you do some nonsense out there right something to make people believe he's not a creepy old guy anymore but it's just a shame that you know these public officials aren't held to any kind of standard where you would just leave off the strength of being embarrassed and having more cases being brought up and your family being put through all this emotional turmoil that he was so steadfast that you'd willing to just sit and stay in his position because of what because he wanted the power he wanted to be able to be the covid president guy that was sticking it to trump and all this nonsense and now look at him like fondling women that he's working with just an absolute ogre a beast and that makes it it makes sense though isn't it he was so visceral and loud with his disdain for trump and how he was acting when in reality he's just as much as a monster as that guy is himself in it like monsters and recognized monsters so he was probably just seeing a reflection of himself in the white house and he was disgusted at it and instead of maybe facing his own demons he wanted to call it out and make people take put attention away from what he does and luckily these brave women were able to kind of come up and say the experience they went through and kind of speak openly about it and now it's cost him his job the only thing he seemed to really care about um You'd hope it'd be a lesson learned, but these people don't learn lessons. They just continue keeping on. So don't be surprised if you see him very soon on a TV near you crying and talking about redemption and changing. He's already, again, used his daughters as a uh, excuse, a scapegoat or, you know, a reason why he wanted to step away. His daughters existed when the first accusations came around. I don't know. I don't know. It's just, it's just embarrassing all around. But what do I know? Anyway, that's the Excellent Show, episode number 483. I've been rambling on too much already as it is. If it's your first time checking out the show, thanks again. It's been a benefit. It's been a pleasure, benefit. A pleasure to have you here with me once again. Thank you. I appreciate it. Um, make sure you click all the links down below, you know, and connect with me on social and all that malarkey and click subscribe if it's the first time. And of course, if you're listening to the podcast, up a five-star review and a share will help the show go a long way. Until then, see you very soon. Take care. Peace.